a real privilege uh, for me to be asked to do this. Um, I would actually say that this isn't so much a keynote as a, a collection of thoughts. Um, firstly, uh, you can see from my introduction here that I wear quite a number of hats. Uh, I used to be chair of the of PRP Architects until a year ago, almost to the day, stood down and have become a consultant to it and um, operate in a, in a pretty much independent capacity, although I still obviously work with PRP. I'm also chair of the Housing Forum, and the Housing Forum, which I'll come on to, is a cross-industry uh, group which um, tries to influence lots of the issues that you're concerned about uh, and specifically, just to build on what Martin just said, uh, I'm currently uh, seconded into DCLG uh, to work uh, with them on a specific programme. Um, in that respect, I have to say that whatever I might be saying today is my own personal view. It's not necessarily representative of what government might think. In fact, probably quite the reverse in many cases. Um, just want to, to sort of go through a few things. Um, firstly... Learning from estate regeneration, which is uh, where I am at, at the moment uh, with DCLG on their policy work. Uh, looking at the sort of quality generally across housing industry, what do we mean by it and what are the issues. Uh, some aspects of policy and how you might change policy regulation standards. Um, my main theme though is about putting the consumer <coughs> or the customer at the heart of what we do. So touching on some of the issues that um, uh, will become a recurring theme, I'm sure, which is about health and housing and so forth. Uh, just a, a couple of words about the Housing Forum. Uh, we're a, an organisation that helps to inform, influence. Uh, we've got um, representation on our board from the GLA and from DCLG, so there's some direct connections uh, for them into industry and, and vice versa. Uh, and it's, I think, um, a credit to all those organisations, like UK, UK GBC, we've got um, a whole series of different fora that uh, are there to try and influence uh, our policy makers uh, for the better. Um, I wanted to um, start with a few words about the uh, work I'm doing uh, on estate regeneration and I use this as an example of how best to deal with the issues of quality right across the piece about how, how do we get this right. There's so many mistakes from the past that are all encapsulated in this whole programme that uh, I can cherry pick and tell stories about how housing should be better uh, just through um, explaining what estate regeneration is all about. The last Prime Minister uh, announced a programme earlier this year, uh, probably one of his uh, significant legacies in housing terms, uh, to look at um, uh, estate regeneration. A hundred estates were proposed to be regenerated. He appointed Lord Heseltine, who has a huge reputation in this particular field, uh, to a chair, co-chair with the Housing Minister, uh, an advisory panel of experts, uh, and uh, it's still active, it's still operating until probably the autumn statements when the autumn statement will, will emerge with a series of uh, uh, recommendations on uh, regeneration. And my particular role is I was asked by DCLG to come in and work with their team internally to support the advisory panel, uh, particularly on issues to do with design and quality. And the outcome of that will be some form of checklist uh, quality uh, uh, procedures, uh, what the process should look like. Uh, and uh, that's, for me, uh, you know, really useful. I mean, I cut my teeth on uh, estate regeneration in housing uh, 25 years ago, so it's so a wonderful way for me to use uh, my knowledge and skills. So as I say, nowhere uh, else is it better expressed uh, about the issue of quality. Right across the UK, this isn't just an issue in London where you do see a lot of regeneration going on, but I've been travelling around the country looking at all sorts of failures in design, failures in technical performance, in management, maintenance, social issues. And there's some serious, you know, uh, 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 things to, to put right. Uh, and I suppose the, the responsibility that we have now is setting out some parameters 
uh, for how, in design and quality terms, we avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Uh, getting uh, quality right uh, applies right across the piece, and you know, estate regeneration isn't about just knocking things down and starting again. It's very much about um, refurbishment, how you look after heritage assets, uh, whether you do new build or infill and intensification. So there are a whole series of approaches to uh, regeneration which um, are all credible. The one common theme, and this is uh, Lord Heseltine's um, major plea or requirement, I think, in terms of funding, is how you put the customer, the resident, the people who live on these estates, right at the uh, centre and how you involve them and how you get them engaged uh, throughout the process. Successful regeneration is shaped uh, effectively by local communities and by the people who live there. And there are all sorts of lessons that I think the housing industry generally should draw from how we do that, the methodologies, the, the way in which we engage. And everybody's familiar with those, um, the triangle of economic, social and uh, environmental sustainability and how they all work together. But in regeneration, there's some real um, sort of expressions of how uh, dependent they all are on one another. Because without the right balance, you get the negative effects of that um, sustainable outcome. You get social breakdown, economic failure and environmental degradation. So, you know, this uh, uh, triangle becomes quite meaningful when you apply it to those um, areas uh, which are particularly uh, in need of improvement. Um, design quality, what do we mean by quality? I'll come on to that in a minute, but certainly in regeneration terms, there is a very strong piece about getting the design right, making sure that there's a placemaking approach, uh, generating that economic value that's needed, um, looking at how you create healthy, connected, uh, accessible places, how you use character to create popular places that, that resonate with people, how you make them environmentally responsive, and how you make sure that right from day one you're thinking about how they're managed into the future. So it's not just about the now, uh, it's about how they might last, and that's a, a sort of 100-year scenario rather than many estates which are, are demolished after um, no more than 30, 30 years or so. Um, delivering quality, what do we mean by quality? Um, sadly, right across the housing industry, uh, there are gaps and there are issues that we need to address. I think first of all though, and I'm sure this will come out uh, during the day, what do we mean by quality? I think that's a, a big issue. Uh, from an architectural point of view, it's quite clear the design parameters, they're clear issues about you know what buildings look like but that isn't all of it what standards you apply to um, what the build quality is uh, and how they perform in practice and those are the sort of areas I'm sure during the day we'll be referring to I was interested to see that uh, you had copies of this particular document um, uh, in reception I urge you all to read it uh, Peter Bonfield and I sat on the sounding board for the APPG, uh, which was specifically set up by MPs who had a plethora of complaints arriving at their uh, door, um, at their surgeries, about the quality of homes uh, uh, and the, the, the way in which homes, um, the, the, the defects are being remedied and the difficulty that they were having in getting uh, housing, house builders uh, to respond positively to uh, the problems. And after a very protracted and long-winded sort of um, consultation process, this document came out uh, in May, uh, sadly just before Brexit, because I think it's been sort of slightly swept away <coughs> by uh, uh, lots of other sort of issues that concern MPs at the moment. Uh, what it was dealing with uh, is, is issues around the increase in supply and how increase in supply is... Uh, leading to uh, a, a drop in quality and it's even reflected by the house builders uh, data which is um, collected which shows that there is a, uh, a higher complaint uh, from customers than there had been before. Uh, they downplay the degree of the problem but there is a problem. Uh, something like 93% uh, of homeowners report some sort of defect of which 35% are 11 or more defects and that's a substantial complaint 
uh, how you check quality and how you check the workmanship is a, is a, is a, is a difficulty, complex warranties, um, performance gap on energy efficiency. There's a whole series of things that relate specifically to build quality. So this quality issue narrowed down in this particular APPG to just how things are built. And I won't go right through this list. Uh, you can read the report, but um, I think there's some really interesting uh, sort of pieces in there which uh, relate to uh, how we might tighten up the system. And I suppose this isn't just about house builders, this is about our industry generally. This isn't sort of picking out um, uh, uh, individuals, it's about a general issue. And um, it's very interesting, on very complex projects, uh, you have very good quality processes that are in place, but as a house builder or a smaller uh, operator operates, there are fewer quality processes. So that, that sort of um, was highlighted. Um, the need for some sort of default for the customer so that the customer actually has some sort of redress or point of redress that can sort of mop up uh, issues. Um, uh, the whole issue around skills and training and a recognition that that needs to be addressed in some sort of way. Uh, I don't know where this uh, report is going to lead, um, but I, I believe that you know it picks up on uh, a lot of the issues, and I'm hoping very much that it won't just get swept under the carpet. It has to be said that Steve Stone from Crest was part of this um, APPG, and he agreed with with a lot of this. It wasn't um, just you know MPs and uh, 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 observers. Or, or complainants, it was actually a recognition from Steve himself uh, uh, that there was a problem. Right, I'm going to flit around a bit and just go through some of the things that I think relate to quality in a wider sense. Um, standards, I mean, I, I was very engaged, as was the BRE, in uh, how the regulatory framework um, gets got, got sort of condensed, particularly on building regulations, uh, how we've got a much simpler set of legal requirements now which I, I personally uh, think is was the right way to go we actually have a space standard which is you know a major breakthrough after you know not having anything for 30 40 years uh, that suggested what is good space we now have that um, we have the uh, the ability to bed those into local plans uh, we have design guides and we have lots of guidance notes around what that regulatory framework is. Uh, just a few words about space standards, because that was uh, a passion of mine. I think we're making really good progress, but uh, how many local authorities are actually taking it up is quite a, a concern to me, and the regularity or the, the consistency with which um, it's taken up is, is sort of moving away from this idea that we all had that there would be a level playing field and every, everybody operated on the same quality threshold. Uh, I think there's a real uh, need to review that and to make sure that um, you know, we get the processes right that enable local authorities to bed these standards into their plans. Uh, a few things have happened since that in terms of new tenure models coming forward, uh, much greater stress on affordability and a lot of demand now for flexibility in applying those standards, which um, I think we have to accept that there is a market push for that. Uh, but we need to sort of make sure that if we do move away from a standard that we have a comply or justify approach, which is what's bedded into the Manchester Residential Quality Guidance. And I really recommend that those who design read that because it's, it's probably the best uh, accumulation of uh, all the quality issues that need to be uh, sort of considered uh, in, in the pre-planning stage. Um, and, and they actually say, I don't mind it being flexible, we, we want this standard. If you're going to be uh, uh, wanting to move away from it, we need a good argument for not doing it. And we need exemplary design. Um, lots of people will talk much more authoritatively about energy this morning, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think great disappointment that the Partel improvements haven't been brought forward. Um, I personally think that that was a betrayal almost of the whole housing standards review process. It makes it more challenging for, for local authorities, but they can achieve, uh, they can achieve um, or set higher standards uh, in some way. The GLA have has almost cast aside government's sort of approach to this and 
decided on their own approach, which um, should lead to zero carbon, albeit probably an offset arrangement in some sort of way, but at least it's, um, it's set a bar. Um, overall, from the Housing Standards Review, I think um, there is a need, I think, to look at some of the things that got left behind. I mentioned space and the need to review how many local authorities are actually going to be taking that up. Has it worked? Is it working uh, correctly? Viability is still dominating the whole agenda, and should it be so dominant? Uh, I think some you know, mechanisms for modifying that impact. And there are lots of areas in, in building regulations that continue to need to be reviewed. Um, the um, issues around uh, air quality, uh, overheating and so on, still unresolved. Uh, and uh, we expect, I think, that government will continue to review uh, or keep things under review. You've got a really good guy in Richard Harrell in the DCLG. I didn't quite understand how good he was until I'd been actually in, in the building. He's an architect and he cares passionately about these things. So there are one or two um, standard barriers there. Um, so what are the alternatives for regulation? I think uh, we'll probably hear a lot about that today. I'm personally um, uh, really interested in how you drive the customer uh, towards better quality. And you know, rather than regulate, how do you, you create a pool? Um, health and well-being being a key driver, uh, and um, also how you might bed all these requirements in design guides, or and how do you how do you influence those who have a long-term interest, and how do we learn from the commercial uh, uh, industry that takes a 25, 30-year view of development rather than a, a short-term view? Uh, it's interesting that there is now no link between quality performance and funding in the government's eyes. It's all about numbers, and that's a real worry for uh, those of us who care passionately about quality. Don't tweet that, please. <laughs> um, I think uh, some, obviously, you know, uh, voluntary standards still have a major role, and I'm <coughs> delighted that the... Um, the home quality mark seems to be having a, a degree of traction. It's a difficult sell to house builders, but at least it's out there. Bream Communities is still a good default in terms of community and uh, estate regeneration. It's a good, a good tool, and there are lots of other tools out there. I'm sure we'll hear more about home quality mark later. Um, another interesting area for me is how the link between funding investment decisions are made and quality and performance. Uh, um, the energy efficient mortgages that seem to be announced recently seem to be breaking into this space where uh, there's an encouragement to invest in things that are taking a 25, 30 year view instead of uh, a short term view. So it's, it's long term patient, patient capital investment, which is the sort of investment that uh, government is trying to encourage into things like estate regeneration, build to rent and so on. It's trying to encourage this longer term view. Um, I think we shouldn't um, underestimate what uh, government does say in terms of policy. Uh, when it comes up with an initiative, people jump onto it. And uh, I don't know whether th there's a great awareness of uh, this Healthy New Towns programme, which has identified 10, uh, 10, 10 large-scale developments where health is embedded and ingrained right from uh, day one. Uh, it's looking about how... Uh, uh, health, healthy initiatives can, can actually sort of be uh, built in. Uh, some of those initiatives here, multi-generational communities, how health, social care can be integrated better, how uh, dementia, mental health, th all those issues can be sort of dealt with in a way in which um, is, is, is good for uh, uh, building in, in healthy considerations in development. It's very interesting, actually, some of the work that I'm doing on estate regeneration is all of the capital invest, all, all of the money that gets spent on unemployment, health care, uh, uh, all, all the budgets that government has to spend, the DWP budgets, are, are being looked at on, on an estate and deciding how you might capitalise that and use it in a different way and introducing social impact bonds, which might actually look at um, uh, how savings can be made. So there's some drivers coming out of government, which I think will uh, be very interesting support to support some of these initiatives around customer care. Um, I won't go through this because I know Joe's going to probably be talking about this, so I won't 
I won't go through it, but I mean, I, I think UKGBC has done some great work around this and making that link between health and housing in a very, you know, graphic and very compelling way, which um, I think is the sort of thing that, you know, we, we want to um, uh, lean on and point our, our clients to that, um, you know, this can make a difference. Uh, and just finally, just to wrap up, I mean, I th I, my good friend Bill, I know is in the room, um, is, is sort of working really hard to try and get to this point of where, where does the customer uh, look at things. And there's, this building is obviously on the innovation park here. Bill's book, Consumer at the, at the Heart of It, you know, what's the running costs of, of buildings, um, is providing options on layout, um, taking account of health and well-being. I think I'm right in saying it's one of the lowest embodied carbon possible in buildings. Air tightness, 1.3. Uh, no net energy bills, surplus um, uh, energy to run a car. So some really good innovations around that. And uh, in terms of construction, you know, looking at how uh, a kit of parts, how people can actually engage in the building process and how that might actually become a retail offer. Uh, so playing into the custom build, the self-build as well. A super insulated structural steel ring beams which um, are prefabricated solar roofing and, uh, you know, some real innovations in battery technology. A plug for Bill. He's doing a great job. Um, I think, and finally, you know, how do we address the skills gap? It's a great um, uh, 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 issue, particularly, I think, post-Brexit. There are some real sort of concerns about uh, the skills. You're hearing much more about off-site manufacture at the moment. Whether that leads to volume and scale, I don't know, but I know government are really interested in this. So uh, my only worry is that government will set an initiative, which will, you know, is the last thing you want. You want the, the market to, to actually uh, deliver this. So um, just a few final words. Um, uh, industry, um, sorry, just in summary, I think industry needs to be much more geared up to uh, research. And I think the architectural profession is now recognising just how important it is to go back and look at your old schemes and see what's gone wrong. Hence, the estate regeneration work. Uh, more post-occupancy evaluation is required. Um, how you address the performance gap, you know, skills issue, you know, there needs to be a much more concerted effort around that. We need, as I said before, to keep looking at uh, standards and regulations and keep pressing government to uh, make changes to that. Um, very often design quality gets sort of left behind and is an add-on. Uh, we need to demonstrate to the industry just what the value of that is and how that, that value can be capitalised and expanded into um, better returns on the bottom line. Um, and I think at the end of the day it's all about really understanding what our consumers want uh, rather than regulating, which is the main thrust of what I wanted to say.